Thanks, Vanessa. Um, you're all very welcome to our conference today um, on human insecurity in an unsettled world. And we're very grateful to the Department of Foreign Affairs for supporting the conference. Um, there's people uh, joining us online as well. And um, before I pass you over, there's only one rule I have to communicate, which is if you're listening online, please put your questions in the Q&A function. Um, so we'll take questions after each panel, and I'll now hand you over to Professor Siegschlag, who will chair the first panel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Boring, and good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure to welcome you to, to this uh, session on global security and statecraft. Speaking of statecraft in connection with global security, we might be tempted to relate it to military conflicts primarily and to discuss how could the security of one's own home country be saved from wars. However, as our speakers are going to highlight in, in this um, session, global security has more dimensions than military defense capabilities. Security also encompasses many other areas, such as economics, poverty, human rights, the environment, and climate change. As highlighted in the most recent, actually a special report of the UN on human security, which was published last year, we are living in an unsettled world, as the title of our conference also acknowledges. The world is fundamentally changing, and there are new global and interconnected threats to human security, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, violent conflicts, climate and ecological disasters. And the report also highlights that people's perception of safety and security is at a low in almost every country, including developed countries. The report found that six out of seven people globally felt insecure, even in the years before the COVID-19 pandemic. So human development is no longer sufficient for human security. And the report calls for a new integrated approach to address these challenges, based on our understanding that our security is the security of others. And the art of governing is crucially important. So to discuss these challenges and policy responses, I am delighted to welcome and introduce the th three speakers in this session, who are all very distinguished academics. The first speaker um, will be Lorraine Elliott. She is Professor Emerita in International Relations at the College of Asia and the Pacific at the Australian National University. She is a former chair of the International Board of Academic Council on the UN system, and currently a member of the International Advisory Committee of the Intergovernmental Platform on Disaster Displacement. Lorraine is joining us online and she will uh, speak shortly. The second speaker will be Kona Gierty. He is a professor of human rights law at the London School of Economics and a practicing barrister at Matrix Chambers. He is Vice President for Social Sciences at the British Academy, and he is a honorary member of the Royal Irish Academy. The third speaker will be Jerry Kearns. He is a professor of geography at Maynooth University and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. And I understand he will um, present a paper co-authored with Dr. Andrew Tucker, who is the Deputy Director of the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town in uh, South Africa. Without further ado, I invite now 
Lorraine to take the floor. She will speak about unsettling human insecurity, challenging neglect, and making the unapparent appear. Hello, everyone. Um, greetings from Canberra, where it's dark and cold. Um, I'm very sorry that I'm not able to be with you there in Dublin. It's one of my favourite places, and so I'm very sorry to be missing it. Um, I'd also like to send an apology to speakers on subsequent panels. I'm not quite sure how long my stamina for late night Zoom is going to last. Um, and so it may be that I won't be able to stay for the, the whole of the conference, which I think will probably go till about one o'clock um, in the morning my time, um, which is a shame from my perspective, at least, not necessarily from yours, because there are some fascinating speakers and papers uh, coming up. Um, we also have a slight technical glitch, which is that you can see me, but I can't actually see the audience. So if I look at times as if I'm um, a bit glaze-eyed, it's not to do with the time of night. It's the fact that all I can see in front of me really is my, uh, is my computer screen. So bear with me, um, friends and colleagues, if you will. Can I just say thank you also to the organisers for um, providing me the opportunity to participate and uh, for facilitating uh, this um, remote participation. In a piece that was published in 1982, uh, Roy Preisverk, who was an IR and development studies scholar, asked if we could study international relations as if people mattered. The concept of human security, which we've already heard, was really introduced to the global public policy lexicon in the 1994 Human Development Report, would seem to provide an obvious vehicle for doing so. But the whole idea of human security, as well as its practice, has had something of a checkered past to the extent that, as I've argued elsewhere, it's become increasingly divorced from its potentially heterodox and critical roots. In fact, as a way to focus on the security and safety of people in their communities, the original ideas around human security were intended to unsettle, hence the connection with the title of the conference. They were intended to unsettle and transform. The 1994 Human Development Report said that human security was non-negotiable, a universal people-centred concern with human life and with dignity, by which people were to be protected from sudden and hurtful disruptions and made safe from chronic threats. It was also intended as an antidote to conventional militarised state-centric views of security. And it was one, therefore, that would require, the UNDP said in this report, a profound transformation in thinking. Um, in the years that followed, the framework for human security thinking was further developed to include freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom to live in dignity, and focused on both protection and empowerment as strategies for achieving key human security outcomes. Uh, and the latest effort, um, which our chair has already mentioned, um, for updating human security comes in that um, special report that was released last year by the UNDP, uh, which called for solidarity to be added to protection and empowerment as a third strategy. Um, at the same time as we've seen the sort of development from 1994 and codified in a General Assembly resolution in 2012, governments actually made it clear that human security was grounded, in fact, in national ownership, that it was determined by governments and that it did not replace state security. I go into this in more detail. There's a longer paper that I'm writing on this, so I go into that in a bit more detail. But there's little in all of this or in the framework of programs developed under the UN Trust Fund for Human Security and the UN Human Security Unit that really reflects that transformational promise or that paradigm shift that was anticipated by the 1994 report. Um, in particular, and despite some discursive attention to things like localised and disaggregated analyses, there's really little recognition of the ways in which human securities arise through regimes of invisibility, through neglect and through non-recognition. People can experience invisibility. Communities, the lived experiences are made invisible 
through a number of different processes, can arise through negative and disruptive forms of identity politics uh, around gender, around ethnicity, around indigeneity, around race, around sexuality, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it can arise through assumptions about political status and citizenship and what it means to be a non-citizen, um, what um, irregularity is in the case of people who've moved across borders, for example. It can also arise through methodological exclusion, that is, what isn't measured is rendered invisible in the data. And it can also happen when an individual's authority to witness and be heard is in various kinds of ways politically or culturally uh, discounted. So being hidden or being unapparent then is both a source of insecurity and it's a condition that provides people of the opportunity to, to be accounted for, to be counted, to be able to negotiate, to review, refuse and to contest or indeed to consent. So that's sort of the background to the, some of the questions that, that, that interest me. In effect, what I'm saying and in response to Roy Presswick's question is that to understand human security, we have to ask not only where are the people, but we have to ask who are the people and where and who are they not. So using a framework around challenging these regimes of invisibility and making the unapparent appear um, and using it to unsettle orthodox approaches to human security uh, as a concept, but also to unsettle specific human security practices and sectors can function in different ways. Um, sometimes asking where people are can generate a much more nuanced and disaggregated understanding of the nature and impact of human securities. Uh, and um, instead of focusing on communities and populations and societies, it can help us challenge assumptions about singular categories such as the women or the poor, etc. Uh, sometimes asking where are the people and where are they, are they not uncovers ways in which forms of human security are marginalised or overlooked or ignored, as well as the ways in which some people and communities are also discounted or neglected. And it can also push to expose structural conditions that are discounted as causes or situations that might be implicated in um, human insecurities. Uh, it, can, it can expose or challenge assumptions about the nature and provision of so-called public goods. Uh, in the longer version of this paper, I spend a bit of time excavating a human security pol um, politics and ethics of recognition that's based on justice and solidarity. Um, but I, time, um, I won't go into that here. So what I, what I wanted to do was think now about how those sorts of questions might look in some actual um, sectors of human security, just to give an idea about what those questions about invisibility, neglect um, and recognition uh, actually look like. I think in the abstract for this paper, I said that I was going to look at three. Um, I think uh, given time constraints, I'm going to start with food security. If time permits, I'll have a quick look at health security. These are two specific sectors that were identified in the 1994 report. And I think it's unlikely that I will have time to go on to um, displacement and, and um, disaster displacement particularly. Food security. Um, on all measures, on almost all measures, progress towards sustainable development goal three, that's the one zero hunger by, hunger by 2030, seems to be going backwards. Uh, the UN reports we've about 2.7 billion, it's about one in three people globally are dealing with moderate or severe lack of access to adequate food and is that, that as many as 800 million are in conditions of acute hunger. A lot of the data that comes out of um, some of the key agencies like the FAO does disaggregate this to make visible gender differences, impacts on children, um, to use various indicators such as calorific intake, undernourishment, malnourishment, stunted growth. And in fact, the whole concept of hidden hunger, which is uh, through long accrued micronutrient deficiency, has also gained, gained prominence. Strategies for dealing with food security and for overcoming hunger have focused on improvements to agriculture, um, purchasing power, so it's really about supply and demand, uh, markets, the role of the private sector, liberalising international trade, targeting efficiency around issues like agricultural subsidies. So actually a lot of those, those strategies don't really focus, they're not people-centred, they don't start 
with asking questions about people and the way in which they experience food insecurity. So in that sense, it's this dominant version of food security for which there is, of course, an internationally agreed definition. It's really fa- framed or approached through some practices of, of invisibility and non-recognition. And those are practices that can exacerbate rather than overcome food insecurity. Um, effectively, what we're trying to find out is in what ways are the food insecure, overlooked, neglected, made invisible? Uh, let me touch on a, f- on a few of those, and, and they come from different kinds of angles of this unsettling process. Um, David Nally, a geographer who's based in um, at the University of Cambridge, talks about the way in which we seek to represent stricken others. And so often in the food security uh, um, discourse, those who are food insecure are identified as passive consumers rather than as active food citizens. Non-acquisitive forms of food agency and informal production are marginalised, particularly in this focus on improving agriculture, which is interesting because, of course, we know globally there is actually enough food produced to feed the whole world. Um, Dysfunction in global food systems and in distribution processes are also overlooked, and David Nally's worked extensively on this. Another form of um, invisibilising, if you like, to use that neologism, is that is that invisibility and neglect arise through processes of what McMichael calls de-peasantisation. Um, so that agricultural industrialization supplants, makes economically as well as politically invisible smallholders, subsistence farmers who are often women, uh, and the kind of farming. So that, that people who are involved in smallholders and food production and probably producing 70% of the world's food are actually unseen except as inputs to a broader process. This has consequences for food nutrition choices available to the rural and urban poor, locks them into global supply chains in which they have um, no opportunity to to voice their concerns. It weakens land rights to the extent that they held them in the first place. Um, it, it feeds into other kinds of insecurities like a loss of farm-based employment in the context of um, diminution of off-farm employment. And it also displaces them from the social and cultural and community importance of food and food production. So if we want to unsettle this kind of orthodox market and production-based version of of human security slash food security through making the unapparent appear, we can do this both through discourse and strategy. And it really makes us think not just where are the, who are the people and where are they and where are they not, but what is produced where, by whom, and for what purpose. Uh, And although I don't have time to go into that, this of course takes us into um, what would be um, a reclaiming of a human rights approach to food and food insecurity. Not just the right to be fed, but the right to feed oneself. And we might see that this actually echoes off that reinforcement of ideas around uh, solidarity. It moves simply from a focus on making food systems productive to making them resilient. And it ensures that people have the agency to shape their own relationships with food systems and the power to address imbalances within those systems. Let me touch very quickly then, I think, on the second sector, that, or second of three sectors, which is health security. We know that disease prevention and, and disease management, general health care, health-related social safety nets are underfunded and underprovided for millions of people worldwide in the global south and in the global north. International efforts to define and manage health security and insecurity have been primarily activity or process oriented with an emphasis on global public health emergencies and the strength or otherwise of health systems. And we see this in the WHO's, um, I think it's 2000 and either 2019 or 21, I'd need to check the date, but the the health systems for health security framework. Um, In the security community, the concept of health security and therefore strategies for achieving it have become increasingly synonymous with global health security. Uh, with concerns about emergencies, about pandemic threats, and the national and international security consequences of highly transmittable diseases, as well as the potential for bioterrorism. So this is really, so human human security slash health security 
becomes in this discourse a pathogen as threat model. It's the securitization of health or what McMichael calls the medicalization of security. So if we pose that question, where in this kind of more orthodox discourse are the people? The answer is hardly there at all, except in some aggregated form as populations that are under threat or as carriers of disease and therefore a threat to others. What does visibility, what does um, unsettling, what does making things visible, what does making the unapparent appear look like in the area of health security? It's a little bit more ambiguous in some ways than it is, say, for food security. Some forms of global neglect or invisibility are specifically so named, such as in the broad issue area of neglected tropical diseases. Other issue areas, such as mental health, remain almost entirely invisible in the framing of global health security. Um, and in other contexts, the securitization skews what is seen and therefore whose lives count. Protection has become, which is one of the human security pillars, has really become a containment model that functions through notification, through surveillance, rather than one that's actually designed as a strategy to support and advance and enhance human health security. And when health is securitized in this way, visibility can become weaponized. So living with a particular virus, for example, and being seen medically or social, socially as quote unquote infected can result in what the Global Health Council calls dehumanizing responses and policies that provide cover for actions legitimizing the unjust treatment of people. In effect, a particular view of security, health security, results in insecurities for others. Um, in many parts of the world, um, noticeable diseases that are effectively written on the body, leprosy is one, disability is, is another, putting aside those concerns about invisible disabilities, they become markers for social abandonment. Um, in still other circumstances, populations, groups of people that are seen as vulnerable because of widespread health insecurities of various kinds, are assumed to be willing but passive recipients of expertise and services. So in effect, their agency is made invisible. So a critical human security approach to unsettling this aspect of the human security discourse and the global health security discourse um, and asking questions about visibility and neglect zooms us in on insecurity as the experience of individuals on the neglected determinants that are relevant to health vulnerability. It generates a much more complex and wide ranging agenda of both biomedical and social health conditions. And it deconstructs pop this idea of populations as the referent of health security by recognizing that, that bodily vulnerability is not experienced in the same way by everyone. Um, and obviously, it also recognises the social determinants of health and the ways in which health insecurity can multiply other forms of disadvantage, uh, harm and vulnerability. So I, I'd actually like to sort of stop there, draw a line under that. I'm looking forward to the next two presentations in this panel uh, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, Q&A af after uh, those two presentations. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Lorraine, for your insightful and fascinating account of human insecurity. I'm sure there will be questions which we will take after, after the all uh, panelists will make their contributions. Our next speaker is um, Connor Gierty, and he will speak about homeland insecurity, the rise and rise of global anti-terrorism -ter law. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say uh, I am a human rights guy and I felt like ditching this entire speech because uh, Lorraine, I know you're out there in some disembodied space gazing at yourself on screen. The audience, let me assure you, were nodding vigorously. There were some whoops of praise that you won't have seen. But mine was this idea of visibility, because 
in uh, the Mansion House years ago, I gave a speech about human rights, and I actually called it the, a visibility project. So I thought it was extraordinary how you had seen as an organizing principle visibility, because I think that's what drives human rights. And you mentioned them, but <laughs> that's not my speech. That's not the one I'm giving just now, unless I forget. Uh, my main challenge is mastering a machine in front of me, and I need to work out how to move to the next slide. So I just want to do this. I, I don't think I need the assistance. I'm managing it all by myself. No, I'm not managing it all by myself. Yes, I am. Uh, I think we'll skip that one. No disrespect to the chair. Uh, no disrespect to Lorraine. And we get to me. Uh, I've got about 15 minutes. You can see that, I hope. Uh, I can send this to anybody who wants it. Uh, I, let me just say, before I start, how it's great to be here at the Royal Irish Academy. I'm a member of the thing, and uh, it's uh, just an honor. It really is to come back to Dublin. I'm from Ireland, but I've spent all my academic career in uh, UK. And I want to tell you about my new forthcoming book. I've written about 80,000 words of it. Gosh, it's hard to write books. Has anybody here read books? Word after word after word. It's like, it's like traveling by car across America through endless, endless villages as you put on another 500 words. People completely underestimate how much work it is. Normally, I get away with small books with very large print that look like books. <laughs> but this one is a book. And so I'm going to spend 15 minutes uh, telling you about it. And uh, first thing I'm going to say is I was thinking about doing a book on a history of terrorism. I am a kind of IR kind of guy. I wrote a book in 1991, which was accidentally an international relations book. I didn't know it was. I'm a lawyer. And it was about uh, the subject of terrorism. That's a long time ago. And I concluded there was no such thing. And that its value in our international culture lay in the fact that there was no such thing. So I thought I'd revisit this book and update it and so on. But I actually was going nowhere with it. I have a contract with an organization, Polity. And then I hit upon an idea. And the idea was, terrorism doesn't exist. And I can't just say that again 30 years on. But I'll tell you what I know do exist. They're called anti-terrorism laws. They do exist. They're tangible. You can go to the library and find them. And then I reminded myself, oh, I'm a lawyer. That's supposed to be my specialism. And so I decided to write a book about global anti-terrorism law. But because I'm interested in history, and international relations. It's not, I hope anyway, one of those boring books. Along comes section 47, B2, you know, long description, followed by section 48. And I asked myself a question. <clears throat> and that's a question. I don't know if you can see it. How did the war on terror, or struggle against international terrorism, depends what you want to call it. The Blair government was very proud of not calling it the war on terror, as though that was evidence of its liberal credentials. Uh, but you know what I mean. Uh, how did it embed itself so completely in liberal democratic polities? That's my question. Now, people like me, of course, hate it. And all the people I meet hate it. And I move in a little bubble of people who are offended, mainly academic types. I ran a, uh, an LSE program. Uh, on human rights, where all the intellectual evacuees from Bush's America came, and we all congratulated ourselves on how we hated it. So I'm not talking, as it were, about us. I'm talking about how easily the extraordinary, on which more in a second, changes to what we thought was our culture were achieved off the back of the fill-in-the-blank war on terror, war on international terrorism. And I want just, I, as I say, I can send you this. Uh, you might say, oh, it's not embedded. The war on terror is over. It is embedded massively. Loads of examples. Uh, the Patriot Act's gone, but all the things that it produced, many of them are now embedded as part of normal US law. Guantanamo, there it is. There it is. Uh, reduced numbers, of course. Uh, better procedural safeguards, more on that in a minute. Uh, one of the more remarkable ones is Article 51 of the UN Charter. It used to be really, really, really super unusual when a country attacked another country and declared it needed to defend itself. It used to be 
unthinkable that you attacked a non-governmental organization and killed them off saying that you were acting in self-defense. The Israelis hit on this as a ruse in the mid-1980s when they tried to destroy the Palestinian leadership in uh, Tunis, and the Americans copied it in 86 in their attack on Libya. These were extraordinary events, extraordinary. Even terrorist hawk types were unsettled by them. Whole conferences were devoted to the breakdown in law and order. Now, as a direct result of the energies deployed on Article 51 Arena post 11 September 2001, it is normal. A country decides to kill a bunch of people abroad, it writes the letter to the UN. We had one just the other day, Mr. Erdogan's in a spot of bother, falling, falling ill on telly and needing to maintain his gangster regime with an irritating election. And guess what? He's just done it. I assume the letter's on its way. The Iranians do it. Uh, obviously, the Americans. Uh, you zap a fellow. It's all been made a lot easier by drones. Uh, but it's normal. Killing people abroad is normal now. And it used to be really, really, really unusual. Article 51 is the UN Charter bit that says you're allowed to defend yourself as a country. And the ruse was preemptive self-defense. So I suddenly pull out a gun and kill you. And I say much later, I could see that in about a year's time, he was going to attack me. That's allowed that's, that's, that's you, for the purposes of this study. Right? So he's, he's looking quite worried, these terrorism experts. <laughs> uh, the same in UK, Irish, EU, except anti-terrorism laws, greatly expanded, no longer temporary, no fuss even. No fuss. Uh, Security Council Resolution 1267, that's about blacklists. Blacklists were extraordinary, where you suddenly go to the bank, and you find you can't access any of your money, and you suddenly try and leave the area you're living in, and you suddenly find you can't, and your family can't, and you're basically dished economically, and in many ways, in human rights terms, personally. And you write to the UN, and you don't know who to write to, and you're the wrong person. The person they wanted was dead, but you, they, you can do nothing about it. Now there's a little bit of an amelioration on which more in a moment, but there's almost no fuss about it anymore. And it used to be a very big thing. There's no definition of terrorism at the UN level. Uh, there are various sub-definitions. Uh, the UN's charter commit, to commitment to human rights appears to have gone a little bit by the way, and uh, this is, I say, the new normal, the new normal. So it's the dog that doesn't bark, it's the criticism that doesn't happen, the energy that is not deployed. What is it? There's been an amelioration. This is an important kind of human rights -y kind of insight. Most of all this stuff, UN, with the exception of Article 51, but UN uh, counterterrorism stuff, blacklisting, British laws on terrorism and so on, EU stuff, has been modified a bit. You know, Guantanamo used to be uh, pick up anybody, throw them in. Now there is, after Obama and uh, court interventions, a little bit of a hearing. You've got somebody who's a lawyer who sort of knows a bit about it. Uh, there, you have chances to appeal against things. Uh, if you ban an organization now, whoops, ban an organization now, do you know? that banning organizations was thought to be so extraordinary in the United Kingdom in 1974 that they had to name the organization in an act of parliament specially passed. And the organization was, of course, the IRA. And the police opposed it on the grounds of the deep infringement of human civil liberties, as they then called it. Now, you can do it by uh, ministerial order. There are scores of banned organizations around the world, which means that if you are a member of something, you are guilty of a terrorist offense, even if you do nothing, even if you do nothing. Uh, but you're allowed to go to some kind of tribunal, usually, or make some sort of complaint to somebody. It's the same with the uh, blacklist. The, uh, you, there's an ombudsperson you can write to in the UN and say, dear ombudsperson, please hold my hand while I beg to be taken off the list. And they will hold your hand, and the Security Council will decide 
what to do. These ameliorations have solidified these changes. And it's a lively question whether solidification makes things better or worse. Uh, it's a lively question. Uh, in other words, is it better to have a pure emergency, which is devastating and awful for those affected, but which doesn't try and be nice? Or is it better to have a kind of ameliorated system? Uh, I honestly don't know and don't have to answer the question. The ameliorated system fits in easily in the medium to long term. So I say, and I'll end with this, not, I'm not ending now, don't worry, don't panic, Chair. Uh, that this has transformed the way we see the world. Why has it been? Whoops, something's happened. Why has it? Whoops, there we are. Why so little pushback? Uh, not interesting for countries that are authoritarian. Of course, there's no pushback. They're delighted. My goodness, they're delighted. It's fantastic news. Uh, I went to something in, in Strasbourg once about counterterrorism. The Turks were leading. You go to the counterterrorism committee of the United Nations, the Saudis are all over it. The glamorous videos presented by the counterterrorism committee, funded by the various predictable authoritarian organizations. And then you go over to the U UN human rights people, and it's some sort of Finnish bloke has tried to produce a home video. You know, there's quite a contrast in resources. It's liberal democratic society. Sorry if that was anti-Finn. Into some ether in Helsinki. Uh, liberal democratic societies. Listen to this. Uh, we used to identify, this is liberal and then liberal democratic. We used to think that the rule of law, protection of human rights, tolerance were the things that made us different. We still think it, by the way. That's what's interesting. Uh, it was so extreme that in the 19th century, uh, you actually had a political exception to extradition laws. Older members of the audience will remember when it used to be a way of avoiding punishment to say you killed a chap, not because you were jealous of his relationship with his wife, and not because you wanted his money but because you wanted to express a political position, the political defense to extradition. It carried on into the 1980s and was a source of huge anger between Britain and Ireland, if you remember, with the backing of Warren's thing. I'm repeating my question, why it's a little resistance. Here we go. I think there are two origins of anti-terrorism law, and I think the reason there's so little resistance is that it's all so familiar. The whole system was in place, point one. And this, I think, uh, is new. I mean, it's a big claim, isn't it? If it isn't new, <laughs> it's an awful lot of wasted words. But, uh, and that this is the roots in this distinction. It's the it, colonial roots. Right. So I'm going to make a distinction here. There's the home, and there's proper away, and then there's home slash away. What's home? Home is the center of the liberal polity. Home is Great Britain in, 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 in British terms. Great Britain. And in Great Britain, throughout, there has been trials. There has been an acceptance of the rule of law. Now, I put down some here. A fascinating looking into it. In the Fenian trials of 1867, there were some acquittals. Acquittals. Uh, the Sydney Street siege, they got no convictions. Uh, four acquittals in a more recent one, the Angry Brigade. That was the British version of the uh, Beto Meinhof gang. Uh, less scary. And then you think to yourself, what's interesting about the British, uh, Great Britain's treatment of the Irish prisoners in the 70s? They needed convictions through the ordinary law. It's interesting, isn't it? And so that's why they beat them up. And that's why they got skews to fix the forensics. And that's why we have the scandals of miscarriages of justice. They actually, because it was Great Britain, it was home, and we believe in the rule of law, and we believe in due process, we don't abolish the jury, but we've got a problem, which is we have to convict these people, so we just convict them. So it's, what I've got down here is hidden degradation. The hidden degradation shows that it mattered. This was also true of abroad. You got home and you got abroad. 
And so Britain was, of course, very proud of itself as a kind of refuge for dissidents. Britain is a bit of my focus, but it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. Uh, and that's the case of Cassioni and the, the various people who were in, on the edge of a rope fomenting rebellion and so on. But because they weren't fomenting it at home or in the colonies, they were allowed to do it, and they were protected. Britain was quite proud of that, Karl Marx and all that sort of stuff. The home away of the colonies, not home, not pure away, the home away was always different, always different. And this is where it's the British, but it's also every colonial power. Uh, the rules did not apply. Now, I came across, you may all know this, it was news to me. Uh, this chap, Savarkar, was being shipped back to India to be punished for seditious articles. And he jumped ship uh, in Marseille, and he ran into France, and he said, ha, ah, you can't get me, I'm a political, I'm a political, uh, I'm a political uh, person, and so I can rely on extradition. Oh, no, you can't. The British went and just got him, threw him back on the boat, took him back to India. The thing went to the International Court, whatever it is then called, and they said, fine, doesn't apply. When uh, our uh, General Dyer, familiar to the Irish, when he killed everybody in Amritsar, he, in 1919, he was the savior of the Punjab. We all now have rewritten history to say what a terrible man he was. He wasn't at the time. He was taught, and he explained it all in clear terms why he was doing it, shooting everybody in Amritsar. And so how does this fit with terrorism? Here, second bullet point. Uh, Indian expansion, uh, the people who opposed British rule, uh, if they ran at them, they got completely killed, just like the Native Americans did when they took on uh, European colonial power in a generation earlier. They just died. I put in the Battle of Omdurman, 1898. Unbelievable. You know, the poor old uh, Mahdi's ran at the British forces, and they just machine gunned them and killed them and so on. And, and they lost about 20 or 30 men, and the, 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 the opponents lost thousands. So guess what? The people who opposed colonial power did not spend all their time running at them with their uniform on, getting killed. And what's hilarious is how, how resentful European power was of natives that didn't run at them and get killed. It's very reminiscent of how resentful we are that when Hezbollah decided to remove the American and the French presence from Beirut, they did it with uh, covert truck suicide bombers and not launching flimsy aircraft in order to get shot down. And we think they're not playing fair. They're not playing by our rules. They're not playing by rules guaranteed to cause their death. The same with terrorism. So what happened was uh, and, uh, the, the objections to a colonialism that took violent shape took covert violent shape right across the empire, right across it. Ireland, obviously, we all know, but I'm specifically not fixing on Ireland for a moment now, because I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, the Roller Committee, Anarchical and Revolutionary Violence Act, all that's in there just for background. Here's the point. The language of terrorism became the language of description of anti-colonial violence. And it, the chap from India came and lectured on it. There were books written by the Indian police on it in Palestine, in Malaya, in Kenya, right up to Cyprus. It was the language of choice. And the language then used was exactly the same as the language used now, within living memory. Oh, it's a civilizational struggle. Oh, they're mad. The analysis of the Kenyans reminded me of the endless so-called psychiatric analyses of the PLO, the mad terrorists. It's straight out of the uh, colonial period. Uh, it used to be Christianity, now it's modernity. We have to give them the chance to deplore their stupid god and embrace modernity. And of course, starting, there's an amazing book, Caroline Eakins, A Legacy of Violence, just out. It's fantastic. She calls the history of the British Empire a legacy of violence. This fellow who goes on about me, Bigger, he's a chap in, he's no relation, I think, of the Biggers, uh, in Oxford. He, he's, he, he's written a book about how marvelous the empire is. But read Caroline Eakins. Right from the start, they were exaggerating, fabricating the atrocities that were visited upon them as she starts with the Black Hole of Calcutta. And these are fan they're, they're fantastical exaggerations of events 
which then, of course, explain the counter-subversive violence. Memories, indications, Middle Eastern stuff, reminded of anybody how a shocking mortar has landed near a cellar of a family hiding causing PTSD, which then warrants the invasion of an entire area causing thousands of deaths. Exaggerated slightly, but you know what I mean. Oh, but this chap's gone on about colonialism, for heaven's sake, it's been over for ages, get a grip, there's a huge gap between that period and today. There isn't, there isn't. What happened was, and I track this, uh, what happened was, the, after the colonial thing, it switched, obviously, loads of countries that didn't exist existed. A lot of them were pro-American, were supporting the American side in the West, and they needed to get rid of their communists, because often the communists have been the leaders, so it became what was called in Malaya by Sir Gerald Templer and other of these amazing British Empire people, many of whom were Irish or had Irish connections, of course, uh, <clears throat> communist terrorists. So the two were elided. And so you see laws I put down to show it's not just England, Lebanon and Syria in the 1940s, defining terrorism, defining it, and saying we're going to stop it. And it was uh, also the case uh, in many other of these countries. So they preserved the laws. Israel, as you know, a famous example, preserved the laws that were uh, mandate laws, anti-terrorism laws, and boast about them to the United Nations now. Uh, what's the point? The Cold War is the enemy within. So this was the enemy without and the enemy within. Uh, and so we become familiar with the idea that there are people among us whom, in the name of liberal survival, we have to destroy. I put in the Mandela thing because it's very funny. It's not very funny, but of course he was the problem because he was still alive and he was the world's greatest hero, a living saint, and he was a terrorist because, of course, South Africa was given free range because of its support for the West. Uh, and, and then uh, Nelson Mandela was a terrorist and he was coming to be received in the White House and they suddenly noticed he was still a terrorist. They had to take him off the list. What a joke. Ireland's interesting. I'm, I'm running, I know I'm running out of time. Stop looking at me severely, Chair. I know I'm, I'm running out, I'm, I'm ending, I'm ending. Uh, no notes, look on the bright side, no notes, no. Uh, Ireland's really interesting, and I'd love to talk a bit more about that, but it's neither home nor away, that's what's lovely about Ireland. Now, we're in Ireland, we think Ireland's important, Ireland's really important, because it's a bit like Algeria. It was and wasn't, it was home and not home. So when, when Northern Ireland kicked off, it, we sent in Sir Frank, and the lads who were well used to things from Malaya, and uh, from, 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 from Kenya, and they behave in the normal way. Oh, it's not allowed. It's not allowed. Uh, and so they're, they should have said, of course, but that's what we always do. But they couldn't, because Northern Ireland was part of the United Kingdom. And uh, the same with Father Ryan, older listeners remember the whole hatred that the British had about Ireland deploying extradition political defenses. Brian Walsh, the famous judge, they didn't really think they applied to Ireland. They didn't really think, what is, what is the Irish doing with this, pretending they're a foreign country? They're not a foreign country. They're, they're colonial. And we had exactly the same with this unnamed Tory, I don't know if you saw it, saying that we need to know our place. Uh, and, and it was like my friend, my friend David Davis, talking about Southern Ireland needing to deploy the guards. They don't get it. There's still a colonial relationship with the place, but by making it part of the United Kingdom, it was a half home. Final thoughts. Uh, I've, I've, I've touched on it in an aggressive fashion. I won't go any further. Uh, the language of terrorism took off between 1968 and 1974. There's a fantastic book by Lisa Stanitsky, which is uh, about this, about the evolution of terrorism. Uh, and it stops being one of a number of descriptions and becomes the core description in that period for reasons I will not now go into. Uh, the response to the 2001 attacks was as extreme as it was, and as embedded, because it was not new, repeating myself, colonial law and the Cold War had familiarized ourselves with the idea that we could coexist with liberal values uh, while doing dreadful things. My former colleague at and the late Stan Cohen wrote a great book in 2000 called States of Denial, which is how you live in a place while denying the reality around you. He'd lived in South Africa and he'd lived in Israel. He went to Israel as a Zionist, he came back as a devoted anti-Zionist because he saw 
what the world around him in Israel had constructed to stop themselves seeing. It's interesting at the moment in Israel where routine changes to law, uh, which for the Palestinians would make no difference, are shocking to the Israelis because they have a noticed that for decades exactly what's been proposed now is what's been happening to the Palestinians. They literally haven't noticed it. And the language of the war on terror is just the same as the language that we had in the colonial period. There you are, about 16 and a half minutes, I think, he says optimistically. That's me over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this thought-provoking contribution. I look forward to discussing this with uh, our audience, but um, we will hear next uh, Jerry Kearns, who will speak about the geopolitics of soft power. OK. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, I want to uh, situate um, global policies on AIDS within um, uh, the discussions around, 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 around security. And I want to begin by um, setting out uh, um, how Michel Foucault framed these and then move on, move on from, 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 from that. So we can think of persons and populations as having um, futures in which companies, states, and multilateral agencies might take an interest. So a company might take an interest in the future of a person through some sort of insurance arrangement. I buy insurance, the company has an interest in, in, in my future. And analogously, analogously um, states can take an interest in the future of populations through um, um, the management of birth and death rates, through projections uh, of um, the vitality of the state, uh, dating back to dating back to mercantilist policies, and in describing this, um, Michel Foucault described a move from conceptions of state responsibilities, where the state um, uh, responsibility is over life extended no further than deciding who to kill, to a state responsibility over the management of the collective life, the collective vitality of of populations, and he called he called this 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 new sort of state power um, biopolitics, in contrast to the earlier um, sovereign state power. This biopolitics um, has um, two parts to it, and the first part, um, uh, Foucault in some uh, uh, lectures called anatomopolitics, and in other lectures referred to as discipline, and in other lectures referred to as forms of subjectivation. But this really is a, a concern of the state with encouraging individual members in society to look after themselves in a way which makes them conform to healthy, vital, um, um, uh, desirable citizenship. So this is a focus on, on individuals. And then the second um, uh, type of um, uh, uh, governmentality, biopolitics more, more narrowly defined, is the state management of, of populations as collectives. So that when the state does something like adjust a tax policy uh, with the aim of encouraging fertility, or when the state invests in um, healthcare with the um, aim of reducing mortality, these um, uh, managements of populations in the aggregate Foucault referred to um, as biopolitics more, 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 more narrowly. Now, in the case of um, human security uh, and, and health, there has been an argument developed um, from the um, uh, uh, early 2000s, mid 2000s, um, that these notions of, of um, biopolitics have now become a, uh, operative at um, international scale and that um, the forms of um, uh, governmentality that I described, anatomopolitics with concern with the individual, biopolitics with the concern uh, with the collective, that these um, forms of governmentality are now applied at a, at a global scale. And in particular, um, a Norwegian uh, scholar, I think he's Norwegian, uh, Stefan Eil, um, described um, human security as 
um, a sort of scale jump in biopolitics that, that really Foucault's I, uh, arguments, which have been developed to describe <laughs> the, um, uh, um, the nation state, um, were now applicable at a, at a global level. And he said this was the, this was the innovation of the human security discourse, which as we heard already, um, developed out of the uh, United Nations development uh, 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 plan uh, uh, from um, 1994 onwards and supported by um, the intellectual work of uh, Amartya Sen uh, and, and others. Now, I think there's two things uh, that, that uh, trouble me about this way of trying to understand what's been happening globally, to understand that what we see is a scale shift from something which used to be uh, state level to being something which is, which is international. The first is that um, the development of the um, biopolitics and governmentalities that Foucault described always took place in a, in, a, in a geopolitical context. And it's one of the weaknesses of Foucault's work that he treats states in isolation and treats them almost as ideal types, which go through stages, always France first, and then you know, other places more or less uh, 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 catching up. Um, but all of the things that, 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 that we think of uh, um, around um, um, securing populations were developed in an international context. So I'll just take one, well, I'll take two very quickly. Firstly, um, food security. You know, Foucault talks about, about the interest of the state in food security and managing a uh, following E.P. Thompson, man managing a moral economy of, of food supply, that was crucially about securing food from outside the state to bring it in. It was, all, it was always a geopolitical strategy from the very beginning. Uh, uh, secondly, health. Health always involved international cooperation around the movement of people with disease and so on. It was, one, it was an area in which, um, you know, going back to the days of the plague, countries required other countries to issue letters to ships to say that the ship had left the port um, uh, with, uh, in, it had left a healthy port and was not uh, at risk of bringing in disease. So these sorts of management of life um, that um, Foucault describes as governmentality and biopolitics um, were geopolitical from the very beginning. That's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is that the emergence of human security as a discourse uh, happened at a moment, uh, a particular geopolitical moment. And it's a, a, a geopolitical moment in which a choice was made. A choice was made about what would happen after the Cold War. That was the choice. The Cold War is coming to an end. Uh, the Soviet Union is no longer um, a major threat to the United States. All sorts of things appeared to be possible. So what appeared to be possible? And it's in that context that human security discourses emerged. It was an attempt to spend a peace dividend. This is just to remind us of the... I'm not sure what Foucault is saying here, but he's really worried about the safety of the child. He's probably going to uh, 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 adopt some R2P to uh, uh, intervene, intervene here. Um, so, what follows the Cold War? There are, I think, there are a number of possibilities, but there are two that are important in the context of the, of the development of, a human security, uh, of human security as a discourse and PEPFAR as an alternative to human security. The first was what we might think of as liberal multilateralism. In other words, liberal values um, diffused, dispersed, spread, enacted through multilateral agencies. So you see this in, in um, you know, De Quayla's uh, remarks uh, at, towards the end of his time as, as um, uh, uh, head of the UN. He says, at last the UN can really fulfill its mandate now. The, 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 the freezing of political possibilities by the Cold War is ended and we can um, uh, um, develop uh, standards for a civilized, rule-based world in which the UN would um, operate as the vehicle of that rule-based consensus. And the... Um, 
uh, uh, UN um, development project uh, uh, takes up the notion of doing a sort of audit of how far the peace dividend is being spent properly on social issues and then later on environmental and later on every, every, other, other, every other conceivable thing other than military. And that's the context in which the human, it develops indices, human development index, and then human freedom index, and all the rest of it. All these things are attempts to monitor the extent to which the, U, the, the countries of the world are succeeding in um, uh, taking advantage of the uh, idea that they no longer have to make an ideological choice between capitalism and communism. They can now make choices around social improvement. And out of that, you get a style of AIDS policy through um, the WHO, one of the agencies of the United Nations. You, you get the, um, the global um, um, uh, AIDS program from um, 19, 1987 uh, uh, onwards. And uh, it, it adopts all of the language of the UNDP. It, it, it adopts the same sort of indices. It, um, it holds countries to, it, it does audits of countries. It visits countries. It investigates their, their, um, their, their national AIDS plans. And um, it publishes um, surveys and, and um, uh, descriptions of the extent to which and the ways in which countries of the world are adopting um, fact-based fact um, uh, enlightened policies that an international consensus has devised and um, suggested. And um, Jonathan Mann, as, as the first director of the, of, the, of, the, of the special program and then global program, uh, made um, human rights an absolutely central feature of, 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 of this aid strategy. Uh, and he argued this empirically. He said that it has been empirically shown that where um, uh, discrimination is addressed and where people uh, are treated with, with, with respect, they, they access health healthcare services, um, they come forward and get tested, and we, we can have an effective aid strategy on the basis of a strong uh, human rights agenda. So that's one strand, the, the, the human security strand coming out as one, one alternative to the Cold War. Now, not everybody liked that. Not everybody liked that, even from, the, even, from the, even from the very beginning. Of course, the people who sold weapons didn't particularly like the idea of a peace dividend, because a peace dividend was really simply money that wasn't in their pockets. So um, there was a lobby uh, in many places, the quite powerful lobby, um, to say, well, you know, the world is still a very, very, very dangerous place, perhaps in ways you don't even see. You've got, the, you've got these sneaky weapons of mass destruction that can be hidden in a suitcase or, or in a toothpaste tube or something. Um, so there was that kind of, that, there was that kind of, 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 of discourse. And um, I just want to um, uh, uh, draw your attention to two lines on, 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 on this graph. Obviously, this graph is, is part of the longer paper when I'll talk about all four lines, but let me just draw your attention to two lines. The first line, this solid blue line. That solid blue line is the share of US GDP that was spent on defense, okay? And you can see that from, you know, here is the, the Reaganite arms buildup, uh, 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 driving towards the end of, of the Cold War, and there is a significant drop in um, the um, uh, national defense spending. It drops from more or less 6% of GDP down to 3% of, of GDP. Okay? And it reaches, it, here we are, Bush 2 comes in. Now, and the second line I want to show you is, draw your attention to, is this line which starts here, which is US foreign spending on AIDS programs as a proportion of total US government spending. So it's, it starts out 0.05% uh, around 2000, and it, it, it ends up not much shy 
of almost 1% of government spending at the, at the peak of US spending on AIDS. Now, this transformation, in a way, the, the, this shift is also accompanied by a significant return to um, high military spending. With Bush too, the peace dividend is, is over. And what you get instead is a, is a, a strategy that um, is uh, advanced by, uh, had be, was advanced from the, from the very moment the Cold War looked like it was ending. Advanced by Charles Krauthammer, advanced by the Heritage Foundation, advanced by the Project for a New American Century. And this was unipolar, the unipolar moment. The idea was that the United States had the opportunity to be the most powerful nation on Earth militarily in every sphere of the world, in every aspect of warfare, and it should hold on to it. Because the world, uh, in, a, in a way that, that, that those of us who studied Kitchener will remember, the world would surely be a much better place if the United States laid down the global law, enforced the, glo the global law, and preferably got the rest of the world to pay for it which in the case of the first Gulf War, they more or less did. Most of the Gulf War was with the first, got the, 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 the Bush won Gulf War was, was, was paid for either by Middle Eastern states or by uh, Germany and Japan. An ideal arrangement for the United States, demilitarize countries, give money to the United States, and it enforces its own decision about what the global order should be. Now it's in this context that PEPFAR develops. PEPFAR um, uh, 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 develops, on the one hand, as um, um, a slightly compassionate side to the war on terror, slightly, but it also develops as an alternative to what was happening with UN AIDS, what was happening in, with these multilateral agencies. Because PEPFAR was very significant spending, but A, it was all bilateral, you know, and initially all bilateral. In other words, the, the, the spending went from the United States to chosen countries. It was spent, it was allocated in those chosen countries by the US ambassador to that country. The US ambassador to that country was, was, was told to seek out um, partners, but not necessarily and not um, uh, 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 with any, any, any uh, priority state level partners. They were to seek, because that was thought to, you give money to states that it's corrupt. They were to seek out NGOs and civil society partners. So this is very different to UNAID. So you give the money and then an international consensus decides what's the uh, correct policy. You know, the, U the United States will, decides, will decide what is, what is correct policy. Secondly, this money, um, uh, uh, a very large share of, of, the, of this money gets spent uh, in, the, in the United States. So about half of PEPFAR's uh, early money was given to agencies that, were, that had offices inside the Beltway. You know? Columbia University was the fourth largest recipient of PEPFAR money in the, um, uh, uh, first, the first five year tranche, that first Bush tranche. So an awful lot of money is staying in the United States. It's been spent on US agencies who will monitor how the other half of the money is spent elsewhere. Third, the um, uh, PEPFAR was, ba was based on, 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 on um, targeting uh, monies at what were called key populations. Now, key populations are universal elements of a, of a, of a society. Every society has key populations. The original AIDS targets were truck drivers, um, sex workers, and soldiers. Truck drivers and soldiers are, never, are not talked about anymore. Instead, there are key populations. Women, um, uh, trans people are now a key population. In other words, there's a kind of universal model of, of, of what are the components of society, and PEPFAR has to, has to, has to meet each of, e each of these. Now, what that does is it normalizes a certain way of describing a population on the basis of, of, of US definitions of what those things are. So the US decides what it means to describe um, uh, somebody's sexuality as a man having sex with a man. The, the United States decides that as a universal definition for the whole world 
And then it is applied by, by uh, bureaucrats in the United States in place after place after place. Fifth, these um, uh, PEPFAR uh, funds are um, heavily subject to um, the whims of, 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 of American policy. In other words, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's within American policy that AIDS policy is decided, not in any international con consensus. Now, what does this mean? Well, for example, at first it meant, uh, uh, and uh, uh, for um, the first uh, decade or so of, of PEPFAR, that no money could be spent by PEPFAR to, uh, uh, to any agency that condoned prostitution. Now, given that sex workers were one of the key popul they were one of the priority populations for AIDS, this, this meant that you could not have policies specifically addressing their needs for fear that you'd be, why was that? Because there were some evangelical Christians in the Republican Party who thought that all US, US monies, both home and abroad, uh, should be refused to organizations that in any way condoned prostitution. This targeting, this, this, this way that US uh, values influence what, what, what countries can do, extended to um, uh, uh, um, aspects of that the, 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 the UN AIDS policy was very largely condom promotion. That was the, that was the major uh, uh, tool of, of the early UN AIDS policy. That was not acceptable to evangelical Christians. And so they said that A, um, no um, institution should be required to believe in condoms before being given money to, to, to prevent AIDS. In other words, you could be an organization which says condoms are wrong, condoms fail. You know, you could say condoms are, are ineffective, they don't work, and you would still be given um, AIDS money. In fact, if you did not promote abstinence with um, one third of your prevention money, you could not be given uh, pet farm money at all. So what we see is this, this way that um, US values are universalized. So, to conclude, I can't remember when I started. How many minutes have I got? Sorry? Okay. It's a good question. All right. <laughs> so, um, so we have these two models. Um, a multilateral um, uh, liberal model and um, a unipolar imperial model. And the unipolar uh, imperial model was, was, was expressly owned. I mean, like, you know, there's some discussion about whether it was Rumsfeld or Karl Rove who said it, um, but there's no question that it was one of them said to, to, to uh, uh, Ron Suskind, a journalist for the, for, for the New York Times in, in 2004. Um, we make our own reality. You know, in other words, US policy is not, is not fact-based. It doesn't have to be fact-based because the US makes its own reality. And Rove said, I, I think it's probably uh, Rumsfeld, it's too colorful to be Rove. Um, uh, 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 Rumsfeld said, we are an empire now. And when we act, we make a reality. And this was in the context of asking Bush and his advisors what evidence they had for the policies they were following. We don't have evidence. We make our own reality. That, how different is that from the UN AIDS model of uh, trying to reach consensus around what policies are effective and so on? It's very, very, it, 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 it's, it's, it, it's very, it's very different. And the um, uh, the human security discourse that comes out of the UN the UNDP is set aside by this new resurgent, aggressive uh, uh, UN colonial, uh, colonial policy, which although it's, it is mitigated a little by Obama, but it's, but it's still the case that the US delivers most of its, most of its health, uh, most of its aid support through bilateral programs. And it's still the case that it uses PEPFAR as a way of imposing on third world countries US definitions of what a normal society is like and whatever flavor of the month it is in the US at that time for um, uh, effective, effective aid strategy. 
One time it's abstinence, um, the next time it's, it, 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 it's be faithful. Um, and that, it seems to me, uh, is, is the way that um, PEPFAR is actually um, uh, a tool of um, a unipolar US strategy and it's, grind, it's grinding its heel in the face of that, those liberal presumptions, those liberal expectations of the people at the UN who thought that they would get a peace dividend to spend. There's no peace dividend, and if there was, you can't have it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insight, insightful and fascinating contribution. I'd like now to open the floor for discussion and we can take questions uh, from the audience here but also from our audience online as uh, it was announced uh, for those of you who uh, are joining us online please uh, write their questions in the q a box and we will read them um, and put them to the speakers so, anyone who would like to start? Any questions for our panelists? Yes, please. Thank you very much to all the speakers. What I really would like to do is go away for about two days and come back and ask some intelligent or slightly more intelligent questions then, but I won't. Uh, just very briefly to Professor, to Conor Gerty. Uh, you mentioned in your slides, but you didn't actually say it. At least I don't think you said anything about the role of the UN Special Rapporteur on Terrorism and Human Rights, who, as you know, is, is the current uh, holder of that office is Irish. Uh, do you have any particular comments, not necessarily on, on her particular role, but on the, the effectiveness of that particular uh, office of Special Rapporteur? To Lorraine uh, Elliott, who I hope is still listening in, in Canberra, f fascinating uh, presentation. If you, were to, uh, if you were given the power to tell governments to advance human security in a concrete way, what single initiative would you want governments to undertake? And the final question to, uh, to Jerry, um, your co-presenter, who's not here today, is, is from South Africa. I lived in South Africa for four years from 06 to 10. My impression, and I'm, I'm not an expert, my impression was the pre pre prefer was relatively successful in South Africa. The problem with AIDS in South Africa at the time was the quality of political leadership, which was quite poor uh, where, where HIV AIDS was concerned. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, I'd like to ask whether there are more questions. Yes, there is a question there. Uh, thank you very much for these very in, uh, interesting and comprehensive remarks that, that, that you made. My name is George Zorabashvili, my best of Georgia to Ireland. Uh, I will have a question to the second speaker, if I may ask you. Uh, that is regarding the, you talked about the terrorism and about the involvement of the states in the terrorism, and the anti-terrorism measures as well. And we, you had the very comprehensive, uh, retrospective, I would say, uh, vision of those acts of uh, terrorism or, or colonialism in the past. You also mentioned some current ongoing times of the different approaches of the states, but you didn't say anything about the Russian Federation, and that is a question that I would like to raise. Uh, as you might know quite well, uh, the ongoing war in Russia, uh, of, of Russia against Georgia as well, and, and Ukraine, currently uh, especially with the Ukraine, uh, there are the more over 40 countries have signed the petition to start the investigation for the crimes against humanity. There, there are multiple evidences, it seems, that, 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 that's in place. At the same time, you know that there are a few states who have already uh, acknowledged or have uh, uh, already adopted the resolutions of stating that Russia is a sponsor of terrorism including the European Union Parliament. So what will be your vision? How will you describe Russia? And uh, did you not say anything about the Russian Federation deliberately or uh, accidentally? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take one more question here, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Jackie O'Halloran. I'm the Human Rights Director at the Department of Foreign Affairs. And my predecessor already almost asked one of my questions. 
Uh, but um, no, I wanted to ask, it's the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights this year. And um, the, um, the High Commissioner has asked all UN countries to, um, to make proposals about what, what are concrete actions we can take that could improve human rights. And this is globally, and this is as a way to honor and commemorate and make meaningful the Universal Declaration on its 75th anniversary. And I just wanted to ask your really excellent panel whose presentations I have just got so much out of, if they would have any suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite now our speakers to give their answers. And I'd like to start with Lorraine, if that's OK. Lorraine? <laughs> yes, can, 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 I, can you hear me now? Yes. You can hear me now. OK, good. I'm not sure whether you can see me or not. Um, I'm going to focus on the very specific question that was directed to me. I'm, I'm tempted to say I'd like to follow your example, take a couple of days away, take it on notice and come back. Um, I'd say very briefly that, and this may go to the question about concrete examples, um, that it would have to be something around emancipatory notions of participation. There would have to be way, we have, a, there's a lot of participation, but it's often what, what um, Palin calls extractive participation. It's about getting data, it's about getting information from local communities, local voices. But my argument is that unless you actually look at different ways of understanding um, how people experience their human insecurities and, and how they actually have themselves um, take an agency to address those, that, 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 that that's actually how bottom-up processes work. This isn't about invited spaces. It's about looking for other ways of um, identifying and, and listening to, to the voices of those who are actually um, facing insecurity. Now, it's not an easy thing to do, um, and there are multiple ways of thinking about this, so I can't actually sort of say, you know, how I would actually run that. Um, but I think that if you don't actually find ways of really making those voices visible and heard, then anything else you do is not going to work properly. Thank you very much, Lorraine. Connor or Jerry would like uh, to... I'll, I'll go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'll deal with the, the three, but briefly. I, I hope this is online audible, but there you are. Uh, Colin, uh, thank you, the first speaker. Uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Terrorism and Human Rights, Finula Nielon, is marvelous. Martin Scheinin was marvelous, the inaugural director. They have been marvelous, tremendous, in drawing attention to the problematic that I alluded to. Uh, Fanula particularly has been a superb. She's outgoing. I don't know whether there is a new one coming in. It's a very important position. What it is is one of the ameliorations that I mentioned earlier. And they are, particularly Martin, absolutely devastating in his critique. And Fanula has a rather sad bit saying uh, it's all very well for the Counterterrorism Committee to say they talk about human rights, but uh, they don't publish their reports. You know, She said the whole thing is lost in secrecy. The uh, second of the three, Ben Emerson, remarked that for all their talk of human rights, the Counterterrorism Committee had one human rights worker for many years, and then it increased it to two. I got a pained letter from the chap responsible for human rights in the CTC after a book I wrote saying, oh, we really take human rights seriously. It's not obvious to me. And turning uh, to Jackie before I get to George, because it's linked, uh, there's the non-feasible and the feasible. Right? The non-feasible is the Irish suggestion in honor of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms is that the Security Council abolish the Counterterrorism Committee with the Counterterrorism Committee Executive Director. And you say the problem of terrorism, as it was perceived and understood after 11 September 2001, is no longer with us. We continue to have a problem of political crime. And so let's assimilate the counterterrorism drive to the policing aspect of the United Nations. And let's weave in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Having said that, given that you have a powerful position, I would advise you above all not to do that because you will disgrace yourself in your office and the Irish won't be listened to. What you could say, building on uh, Fanula's uh, role, you could ask that uh, reports by special rapporteurs on terrorism and human rights require a response from the Counterterrorism Committee. And you could 
plausibly insist on dialogue with the various entities that are responsible for counterterrorism in the United Nations. Dialogue is a fashionable word. People are usually say they're in favour of it. It sounds modest. But one of the uh, sadder features of reading these excellent reports is they are, you sometimes think, shouted into a kind of void. And, and that might be a, a plausible, tangible one. And you could say, feed it in by reference to the UNDHR. So the, the benchmark is the UNDHR. There is no, of course, uh, court that oversees the United Nations, which is part of the problem. We haven't got a mechanism for adjudication. Uh, George, if it was called George, thank you very much. The <clears throat> uh, Russia-Ukraine point, I, I have a feeling that uh, uh, anti, uh, the subject of terrorism died when, firstly, the Israelis said that Ben and Jerry were terrorists because they were, they were not selling ice cream. I thought that's the final absurdity of the language of terrorism. And I think that it's interesting how there's been a major shift away from terrorism towards anti-Semitism as the thing now to avoid. And it's been very successful. There's been international declarations on what anti-Semitism is and so on and so forth. The Israelis are not pushing terrorism as much as they were. And secondly, relatedly, when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, we had to search for new language. And the language of terrorism is not appropriate to Russia and Ukraine. I, I talk about it endlessly with my students. And my point in doing it is to say that terrorism is isolated acts of communicative violence by vulnerable organizations acting alone. Uh, and it is the only thing that terrorists do. Whereas states engage in a whole range of methods of killing for political ends, of which communicative violence is one. And so therefore, the language of terrorism is not suitable, in my opinion, to describe the Ukraine-Russia war. And you picked it up yourself. What is it? It's international war crimes is suitable. So it's a remarkable thing to read, if true, that Mr. Putin has been told that he has to do a visit to South Africa down the line for fear he'll be arrested in South Africa. You don't have to call him a terrorist to achieve that end. You have to indict him at the International Criminal Court. So I think the language of international criminal justice is a better language with which to describe what's going on in Russia, Ukraine. However, uh, it's interesting to see how Mr. Putin uh, is terribly determined to call it terrorism whenever he's attacked, because he's trying to avail of our language to get us to understand that the Ukrainians are awful, whereas in fact it's out of date language. I believe it's out of date language. And my point in my, my, my remarks is anti-terrorism laws surviving the end of the, the golden era of terrorism. You know what I mean? Thanks very much, Jerry. Yeah, um, I mean, let me let me start with the um, uh, provocation to think to think about about rights. Um, I would I would say that um, uh, in in the in the area of of AIDS, uh, thinking about rights has to be accompanied by um, advocating for and um, uh, trying to oversee um, mechanisms um, to uh, implement rights. So what you what you have in the case, I mean, just, just I mean, it may happen today. Uganda um, may today pass a law which um, will um, put get gay men at the risk of being executed for for um, uh, for sex, and it's a it's a law which those evangelicals in the United States who designed PEPFAR were in Uganda promoting and um, used the, um, the, the, the US, you know, uh, avoid sex, um, um, uh, outside marriage, et cetera, et cetera. They used, they, they used that, 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 that pet far, 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 far language and those pet far monies to allow um, Uganda to move away from the, 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 the sort of um, uh, visibility for gay people and the lack of discrimination uh, towards gay people that were critical parts of the global program on AIDS and towards um, subcontracting large parts of their AIDS policies to faith-based organizations that advocated for the murder of gay men. 
And that law may be passed today. It's going back to the government today because um, Museveni thought that the first version that he saw two days ago uh, was not severe enough. So um, it's okay for, for uh, um, uh, multilateral agencies to, to talk about lack of discrimination. But if they don't say that lack of discrimination means that you can't have a law that makes gay sex illegal, then really, what is lack of discrimination? You know, it's, it, I mean, it's the worst kind of window dressing. So I, I think that the, 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 the language of rights needs to be um, uh, accompanied by um, a language of enforcement uh, and not just ask people to make statements in favor of, of things. They need to actually say that certain countries um, uh, um, um, have, have laws um, which are so f egregious with respect to, to, to human rights um, that, um, uh, that they, they cannot be the recipients of certain sorts of program funds. And to be given AIDS program funds to Uganda in the light of this, I think, is, 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 is disgraceful. Um, to come back to the, the point about, about South Africa, I mean, the point about bilateral programs is, is not that they're bad for every country that receives the money. I mean, they're, they're, you know, if you're if you're one of the chosen, uh, um, uh, then um, the the bilateral money can be can be very welcome. But the way it's spent in South Africa is not particularly welcome. And you and you and you 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 talked about um, um, uh, uh, corruption and lack of state capacity. Well, very little of the pet farm money uh, enhanced state capacity. Very little of the pet farm money was spent by by state agencies. It was it was uh, expressly targeted and delivered to non-state agencies, you know, uh, NGOs like Enova and, 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 and also like um, um, uh, Billy Graham's sons, um, uh, uh, evangelical Christian organizations, a big, a big actor in, in, in South Africa on monitoring and evaluation. Monitoring and evaluation is done by, uh, you know, so monitoring and evaluation not done by the South, the South, African, the South African state. So you're not really building capacity in South Africa to, to um, in any sustainable way, own that policy if you subcontract most of the work to, 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 to non-state actors, particularly if you subcontract it to non-South African non-state state actors. Secondly, the, the, the forms of um, uh, measurement protocols that um, uh, the, the United States devises, devised in the United States and then just, just you know, sent by email, uh, uh, to, to, to South Africa. The targets um, uh, are, 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 they have to be like really, really simplistic in order to, to um, um, get political support. So 90, 90, 90, now it's 95, 95, 95. 95% of the people who have HIV will know they have HIV. 95% of them will um, be on retrovirals. 95% of those will be continually uh, 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 compliant, but the, but the OVs in that are not measured. So as long as you show a certain proportion of the population are HIV aware, which is easy to measure, as long as you show that a certain proportion are, are um, receiving retrovirals, which is, which is, easy, which is easy, you know, relatively easy, e easy to measure, it doesn't matter if the, if, the, if the people receiving retrovirals this year are the people who received it last year. And the, the trouble with that is that that happens regionally. So uh, PEPFAR closed out, effectively closed down its support for an entire South African province because it was not happy about the quality of governance in that province and moved the money to another province. Well, that's like taking the water out of the fish pond and then coming back a year later and asking the fish they'd like some water again. You know, you can't do it like that. You know, so these measures that, that are these, these performance measures that, that are part of the of, of governmentality from a distance. You know, you basically declare a global emergency. And you say that the United States can decide when there is an emergency. So the United States can, can suspend civil liberties in, in these countries in, in, in support of that agency. Well, that's effectively saying the United States is a global government. And governing from a distance in that way uh, lacks nuance and it produces these, these um, um, counterproductive outcomes that a whole province can just lose its program overnight. You know, the next, after a year, it won't have the trained people to carry on the program. They'll, they've had to done something else. They're probably truck drivers. Thank you very much. I'm conscious that we are beyond the time it was allocated for, for this session, but can I ask whether there are any quick questions from the online audience we can take at this stage? I'm not sure how...
Uh, hi, this is a, probably a question for you, Lorraine. Um, will AUKUS make the world more unsettled and humanly insecure? Yes. <laughs> that's, that's a very good and short answer. <laughs> Could I say, by the way, this is where I actually have to remind people I'm not Australian. I am actually a New Zealander who lives in Australia. So, um, so I, 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 have, I have no particular um, attachment to, to AUKUS from a citizenship point of view. Thank you very much, Lorraine. And with that, I'd like to thank you, the three speakers again, for their very fascinating and thought-provoking contributions. I think we have learned a lot this morning, and many thanks again. And also many thanks to, to you all for your interest and for participating in this session.